Here we go. All right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of We As. Uh, I am Gareth, your host for today. I'm excited to bring you another show. And just before we jump into it, I just want to say thank you for being here. Thanks for listening. We all truly appreciate the support. You coming on, listening to the show, sharing it on your social media stories, you know, getting it out there to everyone. You know, if you're learning stuff, you're getting stuff from these podcasts, share them with your friends and family because it really helps us to, you know, keep recording these great shows, get the content out there. You can also head over to our Patreon account or our Buy Me a Coffee account. And if you want to contribute to keeping the mics on, as we like to playfully say, then you know we really appreciate that you can find all the links in the show notes so without further ado we're going to jump in and today i want to introduce uh, christian lopez to the show christian how are you today i'm doing well gareth thanks for having me brother well thank you for being here uh we myself and christian connected um back you know over the last few months we're both uh, kind of LinkedIn and collaborating with an amazing organization, Tether, and the regular listeners to the show would have heard Addison on the show, had Matty on the show before, and we've done a lot of great work with them. And I just saw this great opportunity for, for us to connect today and share a little bit about what we're doing on our, you know, our individual channels and, you know, just a little bit about your story. So, you know, a, a real simple introduction and uh, Christian's going to get a little bit more into that, but uh, basically, Christian was a former professional athlete, and he's out there in the world now kind of taking that his kind of experiences in his background, inspiring men through conversations and topics that are not the norm, shall we say, or haven't been in the uh, in, in history been the norm for men to talk about and regulars to the show that know the genesis of we as men start talking into all of our other channels. And now the we as channel, which we're kind of building out with some new hosts and some new kind of a new look, I guess. Uh, yeah, it's very much aligned. And I saw this amazing opportunity and I'm in, intrigued to hear a whole load about kind of your story. So I'd love to kick off with just, uh, Chris, if you can share a little bit about Behind the Mas the Masculinity podcast and just tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about the genesis and what you're doing over there on your channel. Sure, man. Thank you again, Gareth, uh, everybody that's listening, everybody that's part of this. Um, you know, it's not, it's not easy to, as you know, to run a podcast, to edit it, to get it out there, to promote it. Like it's, it's tough. It's tough, man. So just, just thank you, man. I feel honored and, and I feel humbled that you would, that you would consider me to even come on and, and have this conversation. So just big thanks to you guys and everybody else that's, that's a part of it as well. So first and first and foremost, thank you. And, you know, uh, when you, when you reached out to me today, you sent me like this little form to fill out. And I was like, man, this is so profesh. Like Gareth, Gareth's got this going on, man. Like when I ask people to come on, I just reach out to them through like Instagram or something. They're like, Hey man, I, I, I like, I like what you're doing. You want to come, want to come have a conversation on my podcast. I don't have like so, any Google form. So like, so big ups to you on the, on the professionalism, man. That was, that was great. And I wish I would have I wish I would have given you a little bit more of an intro to go on. But when I filled that out, I was like in work and I was just like, ah, I don't want to get too deep into it. I'm in work and I want to make sure it's good. So I was like, I'll just go into it when, when we're here. So, so that's, that's what we'll do now, man. But, but yeah, awesome. Great on the professionalism. Awesome, man. So, uh, so yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me, man. But anyway, yeah, behind the masculinity, um, I'll get to how that started, you know, kind of the catalyst for that. And then I'll, I'll jump into my backstory as well, but, but yeah, behind the masculinity was just pretty much started. I started, um, started doing like blog posts, uh, just, just opening up, being vulnerable, sharing stuff that I had been through. And then, you know, I got to the point where I was doing those, those blog posts. And I was just like, man, it takes a little bit of time to, 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 you know, to write and, and to edit and to put it out there and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I love, I love speaking. I love having conversations. I love talking. That's why we're doing this podcast together right now. I just love, I love talking to other men, to just other human beings. So I thought to myself, I was like, man, I love listening to podcasts and I've been doing these blog posts and putting stuff out there and putting myself up out there and being open and being vulnerable. Why don't I just, why don't I just, just turn this into a podcast? But as you know, fears and insecurities and doubts, which I'm sure you're, you're very familiar with, um, get the best of you sometimes. So it took me about a year from when I had the idea of maybe I should make this a podcast to actually sitting down at my computer and saying, okay, screw it. Google, how do you start a podcast? And just pretty much went from there. Like there was in between, there was so much like, oh yeah, I should really do this. Funny enough, I have a friend the other day who posted on Facebook. He's like, man, 
I think I should really start this podcast. And, and I, I remember him months, like during the pandemic and like seeing him post, he was just like, Hey, I'm thinking about part starting this podcast. And now we're like months later. He's just like, ah, I think I should really start this podcast. I was like, and I just, I can relate to that. I can re that resonated with me because I was in that same boat where I was just thinking about it and thinking about it. Like, Oh, this is just great. It'd be a great idea. And hopefully people would listen and yada, yada. But again, the fears and the insecurities held me back. So I knew exactly where it was coming from. So I just posted, I was just like, just do it, bro. Just do it. Just don't even think about it anymore. Just do it. Just record that first episode, put it out there, see how it goes. If you love it, you love it. Keep it going. So yeah, it took me about a year to actually sit down and finally do it. I had, I had this microphone because my, my wife uses it for work. So I had a good microphone. I had a laptop, laptop. It's essentially all you need. You know, yep. basics, a, a good, you don't even need a good microphone. Like with the, with iPhones nowadays, you can record it straight into your iPhone or whatever it is you have. I, I have a Mac, so I just use GarageBand to edit it. It's so simple. Like you don't need this whole high tech gadgetry stuff. If you do have it, awesome. Like that's great, but you don't need it. All you need is a will. Where there's a yeah. will, there's a way. All you need is a will to do it. So I had the will, I had the equipment to do it, but I just, you know, the, those fears and insecurities were holding me back. And finally, I just did it. Finally, I just did it. I sat down and I recorded my first episode. And my first episode is essentially what we're going to talk about today. It's titled My Story. And I just go into why I wanted to start that podcast, you know, why I was putting out these blog posts, why I was why I was doing all these things. And that was it. That was my first episode. And I recorded it and I edited it and I put it out there and I crossed my fingers and hope that nobody would call me, you know, can, can we curse on this podcast? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, I was just put it out there and I was hoping like nobody would call me a pussy and nobody, I would say, you know, all these derogatory terms that we use to call what we perceive as weak feminine men, you know? So I was just, you know, fighting those hopes. And then I just put it out there and that didn't happen. On the contrary, I had read men reach out to me and say, damn, dude, thank you for sharing that. That was, that really hit me. I've been through something like this before. I, I went, I'm going through this right now. And just hearing you open up about it, like it, it, it really struck a chord with me. And it's giving me a little bit more courage to maybe start to talk about somebody about this, whether it's my significant other or whether it's a family member, whether it's one of my boys, you know, one of my bros, whatever it is. So, you know, all these, you know, I just, I, I just state that to say, all these fears, all these insecurities, all these doubts, all these stories that we make up in our minds, that's where they are. They're made up in our minds. They're, they, they, they don't, they're 99% of the time, if not 100, they're not going to happen. It's just our own, us being our own, our biggest critics, us being our own worst enemies. That's what it is. And that's what it was for me because, yeah, I've gotten maybe a few guys reach out to me and say like, oh, you're a pussy. Like, oh, you're such a beta male. And like, oh, you're weak and you're soft. But it doesn't really, I don't care because the amount of men that I've had reach out to me that say, Hey, thank you for sharing this. I really needed to hear this today. This helped me get through my week or this helped me get through my day has been, has been more than I could have imagined more than I could have imagined. So, that, so that's how that started there. So we'll take it back even further to where this whole kind of journey began. So um, I was a professional athlete, as you mentioned, um, right out of high school, I got drafted uh, to play professional baseball. Uh, it was my dream. It was my dream since I was a kid. You know, people would ask me growing up, like, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? Professional athlete. Like, I knew. I just knew. I didn't know how I was going to get there. I didn't really know how that whole draft process worked. But I knew that I loved stepping on that field and I loved playing baseball. And that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to do that. And, and I knew you could make money on at it. And I knew you could be rich and famous. So I was just like, that's what I want to do. I don't want to do anything else. I was a good student. Had good grades. Um, I had a lot of interest from some, like, really prestigious universities here in, in, in the States. And, you know, of course my mom being my mom and my parents being parents are like, you know, they really stress, especially my mom. She really stressed in education. She's like, you're such a bright kid. You're so smart. You can do so many good things with a good education. I was like, yeah, mom, I know, I know, but you know, I want to go play baseball. And then when I got drafted at a high school and I got offered that contract, you know, my mom was like, look, you know, I've always told you how important an education is. And I still believe that. And I always believe that, but this is something that you worked really hard for. I wouldn't be a good mom if I said, no, you're not going to do this. You know, I'm behind you. I support you a hundred percent. And, you know, just talking about my mom, my mom and I've been, I've been texting all day today, just because I, I've been, and we can get into this as well, but, uh, but I've just over the past couple months, I've been going through some stuff, you know, just, just personal stuff, just, just sadness and, and not feeling fulfilled and not feeling like I have a sense of purpose or you just, just a lot of like, just downer type type emotion so we were we've been texting all day about that I, I i sent her an audio message yesterday and you know i broke down crying 
um, just opening up to her and letting her know how I was feeling and what I've kind of been going through lately. And, uh, you know, she just texted me today and she was, she was great. You know, as my mom has always been her and I've always had a, had a really close bond, a really good relationship. I've, you know, pretty, she pretty much knows everything. Uh, maybe not everything, but she knows a lot about me. You know, I, I'm just, I've always been honest and open with her. So, so yeah, I was an athlete, got drafted at the high school, uh, went on to go play professional baseball, living my dream living my dream. You know how people like, you know, when you ask, Hey, what's up, dude, how you doing? Living the dream. Like I was literally living the dream. You know how sometimes people say, that and they're like, they're bullshitting you. They're not, they're, <laughs> yeah. they're being sarcastic. They're being sarcastic, but I was literally living my dream. And I got to do that for 10 years. I got to do that for 10 years. So I was really lucky, but you know, being in that position, being a professional athlete, I just think just, just being a human being, being a man, you know, you have these expectations, you have these thoughts, you have these wishes and these dreams and these aspirations. And, and I was no different, especially being a professional athlete. I thought I was going to make it to the major leagues. I was going to make a ton of money. I was going to be rich. I was going to be famous. I was going to be a hall of famer. I was going to do all these great things in the community. And like, I, I just had all these, all these visions for myself in the future. And I didn't, I didn't really come to do, none of those visions uh, really came to fruition. You know, yes, I've, was beyond fortunate and beyond beyond grateful to have uh, gotten to play a professional sport for such a long like I literally got to put on a baseball uniform go play go have fun with my teammates with my bros and every two weeks I had a direct deposit in my account for some money like I was lucky I was lucky I didn't make a whole ton of money but I but I was lucky I was able to do that for my living so you know again I did that but I had I had expectations I had expectations for myself and when I didn't meet those and my baseball career came to an end in 2012, uh, 2013. Um, I left that game with a lot of feelings of failure, with a lot of feelings of being unaccomplished, with feeling like a loser. You know, and the way I left that game was because toward that, you know, I was only 27, I think at the time, 27, 28. Like I could have easily pay, played for, you know, five more years. You know, I was healthy. I've always been in good shape. I'm still in good shape. I could have easily played for another five years and continue to chase that dream. But some things happened toward the, the latter part of my career. And it just left me with this bad taste in my mouth. You know, I, I was blaming everybody else. I was blaming my coaches. I was blaming my manager. I was blaming, you know, the organization. I was blaming, blaming baseball as a whole saying, oh, it's unfair. It's politics. It's favoritism. It's nepotism. It's all this, you know, just making up whatever excuse I could make up to feel better about myself. Because the last thing that I wanted to do in that moment is look myself in the mirror and say, no, nah, man, you fucked up. You can get better. There's things that you can do to get better, but I wasn't ready to do that. I wasn't, I wasn't ready to do that for another shit, six or seven years after that, you know, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to do that, you know, and it's tough. It's, it's so much easier when you, when you fall off the horse like that to blame other people, to blame the horse, you know, to say, ah, it was just, it was just raining and I slipped off the saddle or, oh, it was this, yeah, I took a wrong step or, you know, or, you know, it's so much easier to blame everything outside of yourself, uh, you, the outside circumstances, than it is to look at yourself in the mirror and be like, okay, where could I have gotten better? Where did I go wrong? Where did I lose focus? But I didn't do that. I was, I was still a child. You know, I was a 27, 28 year old man child at that point, you know, so I didn't know how to do that. And I wasn't ready to do that. So instead of doing that, um, at, you know, still a, a relatively young age for a baseball player, I, I quit, you know, I quit instead of doing the hard work of being like, you know what, I'm going to go into this off season. I'm going to bust my ass. I'm going to work hard and I'm going to work on my, you know, strengthen my strengths and, you know, work on my weaknesses. And I'm going to come back next year and I'm going to be, be, be better. And, and this anger and all this stuff, I'm going to use it to motivate me, but no, I didn't do that. I took the cowardly, the easy way out, which was, I'm just going to quit. You know, if I quit, then this game, these people, they can't hurt me anymore. Cause I was hurt. I was crushed, man. That was to me, that was, and continues to be to this day, the biggest breakup, the biggest heartbreak that I ever had, you know, and I've been through breakups and I've been through heartbreak and I've dated, you know, women and, you know, I've, I've dated, felt hard for women and lost them and like been heartbroken in that way, of course. But for me, that was, that was my biggest breakup. That was my biggest, my biggest heartache. So I quit and, and, and it was something that I could have controlled you know, it was something that I could have controlled. It didn't have to end that way. It didn't have to end that way. You know, I could have, I could have kept going, but I was the one that decided like, no, nah, I, I, that's it. I'm, I'm done. I've had enough. So of course, naturally when I left the game, I, I still felt, I still, those expectations, I still needed to meet them. 
I still needed to be rich and famous. I still needed to be validated. I still needed to, people to see me in the spotlight and be like, oh shit, Christian, I, I know that dude, he made something of himself. I still needed that. My ego still desperately, desperately needed that. So when I quit baseball, I, I needed something to replace that. You know, I couldn't just go into like everyday life and work a corporate job and work an office job and, and be rich and famous that way. It's just like, shit, what do I do? What do I do? So I decided I want to shoot. I'm going to, you know what? Hollywood sounds good. Hollywood sounds good. I'm going to pack up my stuff. I'm going to move to Hollywood. I'm going to become a famous actor. You know, I was always good at like entertaining my teammates and being kind of like the, the clown in the clubhouse. And, you know, some of my teammates have had like nicknamed me with this like Latino soap opera star. He's like, oh, you, we're, we're going to call you Federico or something like that. I don't know. They're <laughs> like ridiculous. And I was just like, you know what? Maybe, maybe you guys are right. Maybe I could go be a Spanish Latino soap opera star. Let me, let's go do that. Let's go do that. So, you know, packed up my things moved uh, from uh, Miami, Florida, uh, drove my car, my Toyota Camry, 3000 miles to Los Angeles, California. It took me about a week or so to make that drive. And, but I was motivated, man. I was motivated, motivated, not necessarily by the right things, but motivated by the fact that I felt like a failure and I felt like a loser and I needed to prove people wrong. I needed to be on those billboards. I needed to be on the, in those movies. I needed to be on that TV show so I could show other people like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a failure. I'm not, a, I'm not a loser. I'm not a failed baseball player. I'm a fucking famous actor. Check, check me out now, you know, check me out now. All you, all you, all you people that doubted me and like, nobody doubted me. It was just me doubting myself. You know, nobody was thinking about like, Hey, I wonder what he's up to. It was me. It was me just doubting myself. So, you know, moved out to LA uh, for about two years, you know, I was an actor and, you know, going to auditions and, you know, I booked a couple small things here and there and I had a good time doing it, but it came, there came a point when, you know, especially when you, when you're going from, when you're going from a sport, like, or any professional sport, which is so tough to do a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the people that ever play a sport, get to play it at a professional level and get paid for it. You know, I decided to leave that arena that was really tough and go over to an arena where I don't know 90% of the time you're going to auditions and you're getting rejected and people are like nah you're just not the right height nah your hair color's not right nah you're not you don't look this way nah we're looking for something else so I was just like if I would have thought about that in the in before I even just impulsively moved out here I would have thought like yeah maybe acting's not the best place for a fragile a uh, fragile shattered ego to go right now. But I didn't think about that. I just thought about, I can, I can be famous and I can be rich and people can see me. So I did that for a couple of years. And of course, then I got to the point where that motivation wasn't, wasn't going to sustain me, you know, it wasn't going to sustain me for, for it sustained me for a couple of years where I was super motivated. And I was just like, Oh, I'm going to prove people wrong. And people are going to see me and validate me. But then it got to the point where I was just like, fuck, this isn't, this isn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. I thought I was going to move out here and Somebody was going to see me walking down Hollywood Boulevard and be like, hey, hey, what's up, Christian? Hey, I want to put you in my movie and make you famous. Come on, man. Let's go. You know, I thought that's what it was going to be like. Um, but no, that, that, that definitely didn't happen. And it got to a point where I was just like, ah, this isn't what I want to do. Like, I'm not passionate about this. I was passionate about baseball. That's ah, something I was passionate about. I'd been playing that since I was five years old. I'm not passionate about acting. Like, no, there's people that have been doing this just like I was playing baseball. They've been doing this since they were five years old, six years old. They, they're passionate about this. This is the only thing that they've ever wanted to do. But not me. I'm just, I'm just a poser. I'm just a pretender coming in here and pretending I want to be this famous actor. I don't care. I just want to be validated. I want to, I want to appease my ego because it's been crushed. So it's got to the point where it was, I, was, I was unhappy and I was unfulfilled. And I came home one day and my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, she could tell, she could tell I was out of it. She could tell like something was wrong. And she was like, yo, babe, what's up? Like, talk to me. Like, I can see like something's off. You're different. I'm like, nah, nah, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good. I'm, you know, like at that point I was just like, no, I'm a man. I can't, I can't open up to her about my feelings and about my emotions. No, that's, that's weak. I need to be strong for my woman. So, you know, but she was, thankfully she was, she was persistent and I just couldn't hold it back anymore. And it just let loose. And I just started crying, just started sobbing and just, telling her like, I feel so lost and I feel so scared and I feel like a loser. I feel like a failure. Like, I, I just don't know. I don't know what's next. I don't know what's next for my life. I I'm, I'm lost. I'm scared. I need help. I need help desperately. Um, so she was great. She supported me. She talked to me, um, 
you know, next day or maybe that week or something, I was just like, all right, now eh, I'm done with acting. It's not what I want to do. So, you know, I was, I was done. I was like, all right, cool. On to, on to, on to greener pastures. But I was just like, where's, where's the greener pasture? I, I don't even know which direction I'm going. And I'm not a baseball player anymore. I'm not an actor anymore. What am I? And, and this whole time I'm, I'm searching for my identity because my identity was, my identity was baseball player. Christian Lopez was synonymous with baseball player. That's, that's not just what I did. It's who I was. It's who I was. And that's what, you know, made me the type of player I was. That's what gave me, brought me that success. That's what made me work so hard because I was, I tied up my identity in that because I was just like, no, I, I need to make it in this. I need to be awesome at this because that's who I am. Because if I suck at this, then I suck as a man. Then I suck as a human being. And if I'm really good at this, then I'm good as a man that I'm good as a human being. So this whole time I'm trying to just unravel my identity from baseball and trying to find out who I am without that, you know, without baseball, like who who am I just as a man, as a human being? So just, you know, this is all culminating and then trying to find a new career and trying to find a new path. So it wasn't baseball anymore. It wasn't acting. Then I started looking into firefighting. Um, I forgot what kind of drove me that way. But I, I saw a lot of similarities, like, you know, that brotherhood, that camaraderie, that chance to be a hero in the community, you know, obviously it's good, but obviously it's come, comes with its dangers, but, you know, good pay, good retirement and pension and benefits and perks and, and all that stuff that comes along with it. So I was just like, and I knew a lot of former baseball players had become firefighters as well. A lot of former athletes in general had, had taken that route as their, as their next career. So I was just like, this is it this is my new identity. This is my new career. Uh, I'm going to be a firefighter. So I put two and a half years of hard work, training, getting my body ready, uh, taking fire science classes, interviewing, testing, like just doing, you know, reaching out to people. Like when you, when you, I'm not sure how it, how it is with every department, but I'm sure with most departments, like they do an extensive background check. So I had to like reach out to people that I had known like 10 years ago. I was like, Hey man, I know we haven't talked in a while, but, uh, I I need your name and your address and your phone number. I know it sounds weird, but I'm applying to be a firefighter. So just that process of getting this information and tracking down the old addresses where I've lived and all this stuff was, was work in itself. So, you know, just, just putting in work for two and a half years. And then one day, I'm at home. My wife gets home. I see her. I hear, I hear her footsteps running up the hallway. I was like, what the hell is she running from? Is she getting chased by somebody? And she busts through the door. She's like, babe, you got a letter. You got a letter from the LA city fire department. I was like, fuck yes. So I was like, this is it. This is it. I'm starting the Academy sometime this year. This is my new career. I can breathe a sigh of relief. I'm like, okay, I don't have to stress anymore. This is it. Once I get in there and I put in my time and I make some money and I can retire and have a good pension and we can travel and do all the things that we want to do. And then I opened up that letter, unfolded it. And it was a rejection letter. It was a rejection letter from the LA city fire department saying, Hey, thank you for, for your interest in becoming a firefighter with our department. But, uh, we've decided to not, you know, further you along in the process best of luck with your future endeavors. And they don't, they don't tell you why, you know, they didn't, they didn't choose you or nothing. They don't even tell you like, Hey, this is the area where you kind of lacked. Maybe you can improve a little bit here. Nothing. It's just like, sorry, uh, good luck with everything else. So again, man, crushed, crushed ego crushed. Like, and I had already kind of rat started wrapping my mind around, like, this is my new identity. I had even, I don't think I've ever told anybody this. Maybe my wife is the only one. Cause I shared it with her, but I had, I had, gotten a picture of off Google of a firefighter. And I had, I had Photoshopped my face on that firefighter. So every once in a while, I would look at that picture and be like, that's going to be you. That's That's going to be you. That's going to be you. Like I had doing, you know, doing all this, you know, attraction law of attraction stuff to like, you know, uh, manifest this, this career and this kind of life for myself. So, so yeah, man, when I got that rejection letter, I was crushed. I was, I was crushed. My ego was just crushed. And, you know, I I was thinking this was going to be my new thing, my new identity. And no, just like that, you know, the universe, another like, "Ah, sorry, man, you're not good enough. And that's what it felt like to me. Like it was just another instance of the world, the universe saying like, you're not good enough. Um, So again, back at square one, I'm not an actor. I'm not a baseball player, not a firefighter. What now? What now? Um, luckily around that point, I had, I had started, you know, making some changes in my life. I had, uh, had talked to a really good friend of mine that we were roommates for a while before my wife and I moved in together. And he was, he was one of those type of men that you would find on tether. 
you know, that you would find in, you know, every man is another community that I'm a part of. You would find them in places like this, the type of men that can be honest, can be vulnerable, can be open, are not going to judge you. are not going to shame you. are not going to ridicule you. That was the type of man that he was in my life. And I was so, I'm so grateful that, that we're still friends to this day. And so grateful that he was there for me during that time. But he just kind of hit me up out of the blue. I was already living with my wife at the time. We weren't roommates anymore. And he's like, hey, man, something told me to just hit you up. You know, something told me to just just see how you were doing. You know, I don't know what it was, you know, the universe or God or something, but something told me to hit, hit him to hit me up. And I was just like, actually, man, uh, yeah, my wife is out of town for for a couple of days. Like, I'm free. Like, what do you want to hang out? Let's get together. He's like, yeah, man, let's go have some lunch tomorrow. And I think that was on a Saturday. So we met up for lunch talked for like three hours, um, you know, cried together, opened up, you know, just, just let it all out. Um, like we always did, you know, we always had really deep conversations, but especially that day, I really, really, really opened up and really let it out. And he was there and he just held that space for me and he was really supportive and, and he was very kind and, you know, just told me really some really good things about myself that I just needed to hear at that time. And that next day, I just made a vow to myself. I was just like, I'm going to, I'm going to make some changes. You know, I'm tired of just sitting around and just waiting for stuff to happen. I, I need to make this happen. You know, I need to make this happen. So that next day, you know, I, I started a meditation routine. I started journaling. I started getting more into yoga. You know, I started doing these things. I started devouring every self-help and self-improvement book that I can get my hands on and, and just started doing something. You know, I, I, I didn't really have a, a sense of direction, but I knew I needed to do something because I was just tired. I was just tired of feeling sorry for myself and feeling bad for myself and, and feeling unworthy. So I started making these changes. Uh, that was back in 2017, August 26, 2017 was that day we met. And ever since then, that was, you know, three and a half years ago, you know, I've just been on this, on this quest of, you know, finding out who I am, discovering that identity, being more open and more honest and more vulnerable about the fears and insecurities that I, that I had and that I still have. Like I said, you know, these past couple of months of me have been really tough. So even though I've put in a lot of work, a lot of work, and, and even my wife tells me, she's like, babe, the, the, the man that I met compared to the man that you are now, it's, it's been a huge change, you know, in a good way, in a good way. You know, I've done a lot of growing. I've done, I've done a lot of learning. I've done a lot of letting go of some of these expectations and some of this, you know, stuff that has held me back for so long, but it's still there. It's still there. And it, and it, and it has been for the last couple of months and it, and it still shows up, you know, as much work that I've done. And, and that's, I bring this up to say that, you know, it doesn't matter where you are in your life. It doesn't matter how successful you are. It doesn't matter how, you know, you might be perceived from the outside. Like you never know what a, what a man or, or woman for that matter. You never know what somebody is going through. You know, they might seem like they've got all their shit together and, and everything's fine, but you never know. You never know what's going down deep, deep going on deep down in time. That's why I love having these conversations. I love talking about this stuff because if there's one man out there that's listening to this and that can listen to us having this conversation right now, that can be inspired by this and be like, shit, I know what he's talking about. I can relate to that. I'm going to go put in some work tomorrow. I'm going to, I'm going to start making some changes that, I mean, I just, I get goosebumps talking about it because if we can just do that for one person, we've done our mission here, you know, we've, we've done our job. So, so yeah, man, so I, I, I've done a lot of work and that's essentially where, you know, we get to the podcast story, you know, doing that work. Uh, adopting a meditation routine, journaling, you know, doing all the stuff to, to get out of this funk that I was in, you know, I started getting to this point of like, I want to start writing some of this stuff down. And that's what turned into the blog post. You know, I started putting out blog posts on Medium, just really opening up, just really opening up of, about what was going on, what I had been through, just, just opening up, not, not in, not in, not in the sense of just like vomiting, word vomiting out there just to like, get some sympathy or get some people to be like, Oh, I feel sorry for that guy. Poor him. No, just in a sense of like, I didn't know what else to do. Like I need to get the shit off my chest. I, I, I can't keep holding on to this stuff. I can't keep suppressing this shit because as a man, I'm supposed to suppress it. And I'm supposed to just fucking man up and just figure it out and just go on with my life. No, some people are a lot better at doing that than others. I wasn't, I wasn't very good at that. You know, that shit was eating me up inside. So I needed to find a way to exercise some of this stuff. So that's what it, you know, that's what happened. I started just doing some little blog posts on Medium, started posting, posting some stuff on, you know, social media, Facebook and Instagram and stuff like that. And then eventually we got to, to the point where I, where I talked about in the beginning where, all right, let's turn this into a podcast, you know, and ever since then, it's been just doing this stuff in the hopes, like I just said, of some man, one man out there listening to this and being inspired by it, hopefully. And, and you know, maybe it changes his life 
for the better, just the same way that my buddy and that conversation changed my life, just the way that, you know, these, these books I've read and these Ted talks that I've listened to and these videos that I've watched have inspired me in one way or another. You know, if we can provide that for one dude listening to that out there, then, you know, I, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. So, so yeah, man, yeah. that's exactly, that's pretty much where I'm at right now. But again, it's still a daily struggle. You know, it's still a daily struggle of, of fighting those demons. And, and I, I actually just, actually just signed up for my first session with a coach, with a coach kind of slash therapist uh, next Wednesday, um, just because I, I felt like I needed help. Like, I felt like I got to the point where I just couldn't do it all myself uh, by myself anymore. You know, I put in a lot of good work and I've, and I've grown a lot, but I've, I think I've just hit a point where it's just like, I need some help. I need some help. I need another perspective. I need somebody to guide me through, through the rest of this, because I've just hit a point where I just, you know, I'm, I'm scared of crossing that bridge. Yeah. Yeah. I, such a, um, such a great kind of summary of the story. And I appreciate it. Obviously there's a lot of detail in there. It's, so many i mean i've got like 805 questions over here written down but <laughs> so but the one big thing that comes up for me chris and across your whole story is you mentioned something that i wrote right at the top of the page here which is a sense of purpose and you mentioned how that's something you're you've been going through recently but it sounds like that's been pretty much ongoing through your journey that sense of purpose that's that search for purpose almost and it resonates a lot with me for sure and I've been very fortunate that I've been in a career which which has been my purpose Uh, so I'm very fortunate uh, you know to be in that position and however it because of that and because I've known that for a long time it creates this this need for more purpose if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I want that kind of search that really, that really resonated with me, but it sounds Mm -hmm. like, you know, you touched a lot on community, clearly baseball's community, but it's also a, it's also kind of serving that community, right. That, that team and being, you know, in that spotlight and and whatever reason you step into it, it's still serving that community, right. Cause it's huge, right. Sports fans are, Mm -hmm. are wild. Right. And I know what that's like. I grew up in England, you know, watching soccer and it it is wild and people are fanatical. So it is serving that. And then, you know, acting again, it's a very similar thing. It's an act of service. So it sounds Mm -hmm. like you've had this, this need to serve, uh, you know, and that's one of those, you know, the big kind of purposes that we hear lots of people talk about. And it sounds like that again is coming around for you full circle. And maybe it's Mm -hmm. that now you've landed in the podcast, which is your which is your act of service, right? Like you mentioned, mm-hmm. it's about getting those messages out there. And that's a lot of what we're focusing on at We As as well. It's the same thing. It's trying to, it's just trying to give space and permission to others. Like you said, it'll inspire. And I wonder, this is something else I picked up and where I'm going with it is mm-hmm. you said about inspiring others. And I think what's inspiring and, sh- and you know, you share your thoughts on this too, but action is going to create the momentum and the motivation that you need and it seems like you've done that throughout and it looks like that turning point for you, that conversation you had, what you did was take action, even though you didn't know where you were going, you didn't understand really, but you, you continued on that path and it's yeah. led you here. Is that something you've seen kind of mirrored throughout your life as well through sport and through other careers? Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And I, th- and, and I think that's one of the things that I've struggled with the most is, is taking action. You know, I think that's something that I'm struggling with struggling with now. And I think a big part of that, um, again, I, I, I'm looking forward to hopefully diving into this with my coach. Um, when we start, when we start our sessions on Wednesday, but I think a big part of that, that hesitance, hesitancy to take action is because I think my, you know, probably deep down subconsciously somewhere, my body, my mind, whatever it is, thinks that, you know, relates action, because one of the biggest actions I did was go and become a professional athlete. And that for me, like from the outside looking in, you know, people are just like, dude, like I said, you got to freaking get paid to play baseball for 10 for a decade. Like you're fucking lucky. Like you're really, really lucky. But me being in the midst of it and having all these expectations and all these goals for me, when that happened, you know, I've, I've grown a lot from this, but I think there's a, still a, a deep part of me that still considers myself a failure, that still considers myself a loser. So anytime, anytime that I go take like a really big action or a really big risk, I think my body always reminds me 
always like tapping me on the shoulder and be like, yo, yo, hey, hold on before you take that action. Remember, you took action for 10 years and something that you really loved and you ultimately failed at it. What if you, what if you fail again? What if you go try that thing that you're wanting to try right now and you fail again? And just talking about it, man, and like stirs something up in my body because I, I think that's what's going on in, in terms of taking action is, you know, my body just reminding me like, yo, I don't, I don't want to go through that again. Like, this is my body telling, you know, my conscious self, like, we, we're not going to go through that again. That was terrible. That was miserable. That was the worst thing that's ever happened to us. That was such pain and misery and agony that we still deal with to this very day. Why would you want to subject yourself to that again? So that's something that I really think holds me back. But on the bright side of that, every time I do take action, for instance, writing these writing blog posts, doing stuff like this, talking about stuff like this, when I first started my pod, even to this day, when I go record a podcast and I went, when I go launch it, I, there's still some hesitation there. There's still some fear of like, uh, what if somebody listens to this and I sound like an idiot or I sound stupid or somebody thinks I'm a pussy or they call me names or they shame me or they ridicule me or this or that, you know, there's still that hesitation there. But what I found is that I, every time I take action, every time I face that fear, I'm like, whatever, uh, I'm scared to do this, but I'm going to fucking do it anyway. Every time I do that, it always works out well, always. And even if I, if it doesn't work out well, I can look back and think like, you know what? I, I faced a big fear right there. That's a win. That's a win for me. So, so yeah, even though, even though action has been one of the toughest things for me, like sometimes I'm just so paralyzed by fear and by doubt and insecurity that I don't take action or I really, 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 really procrastinate on something until the very last minute where I have no other choice. And I'm like, I got to take action. But I think that's something that's really, really, really held me back. But on the flip side, every time I do, it's just like, Hey, that there was, there was, there wasn't really anything to be afraid of. What was I so afraid of? You know? So yeah, great, great question. Great yeah. Question. It, it builds, um, it builds resilience, right? Like every yeah. time we, every time we do that thing and we realize it's not a scary or even we do it and we fail, like you can yeah. only really like you either succeed and you take the next step or you fail when you learn, okay, I'm going to mm -hmm. do it better next time. Right. It's that yeah. constant mm -hmm. cycle. And it, I think as well, what, what stands out for me is that maybe maybe we if we're in that spot and we all suffer with that on varying levels you know that mm -hmm. fear that insecurity is if you're really stuck in that in that space where you feel like you can't take action everything feels overwhelming just do one little thing yeah. like yeah. maybe you journal maybe you write one line in a journal every day maybe you walk for 15 minutes every day maybe mm -hmm. whatever it is right because if mm -hmm. somebody's somebody needs to find themselves, whatever it is you want to call it, it is, it's just a lot, it's a lot of heavy shit when you've got this massive goal that's so far away. And I think where maybe baseball didn't present that initially is because you start when you're five and you're yeah. fearless, yeah. right? Yeah. So it never looks like a big step because we're so present moment when we're, mm -hmm. when we're that young, that it's just the next. And to quote, you know, I, I forever quoting Disney movies because I got a four year old, but oh, I love it. <laughs> um, you know, it, they, it's funny because I actually did an episode on the podcast back last year and it was uh, the lessons from, from frozen uh, because there's so many great <laughs> life lessons in it. Yeah. And one of them is it, it just, you know, when you don't know what to do and you're scared, it, you just take the next right step, whatever that next little tiny right step is. And that's, that's what you did. You, you, I'm going to start journaling, which yeah. is really, it, you know, you buy a journal, you pop to the store, you buy a journal, you got a pen, you write a few things down, like mm -hmm. it's a tiny step, right? So I think that's the important message there that when we're, yeah. when we're just paralyzed by fear and insecurity is just do one little thing. And I'm a, I'm big like that. I'm making a big life mm -hmm. switch right now with COVID and everything else that's happened. And it's the same thing where I want to be is so overwhelming. So I, so I've spent the last week doing nothing. Yeah. Uh, whereas what mm -hmm. I need to do is yeah. take that little step. Right. Yeah. And so I did that actually yesterday, uh, made a little step, just connected with a couple of people that I knew I needed to connect with without any yeah. expectations. And just, it's just one little thing. If it goes yeah. nowhere, it goes nowhere. And if it's just having the conversation and not having to blow it into this big, massive thing and have all the answers yeah. tomorrow. So Exactly. Yeah. And, and another, you know, analogy to throw out there, cause I know you're big into, into fitness and into working out. I'm sure there's days where you wake up where you're like, I don't want to fucking work out today. <laughs> yep. I don't want to fucking work. I'm, I'm there. I'm there with you too. Like there's days where I'm like, ah, I don't want to, I don't want to do shit today. I want a day off. But sometimes when you go to the gym and you're just like, ah, you know what? All right. I'll just get, uh, I'll just get in 10 minutes, you know, 10, 15 minutes. 
then sometimes when you're there, yeah, sometimes you'll go and you'll do, you'll half-ass 10 minutes, but sometimes you'll get there and you'll be like, oh, I'm here. I already put in 10 minutes. Let's, let's put in 10 more or let's put in five more. You know, sometimes just showing up is the toughest thing. Once you show up, you're like, well, fuck it. I'm here already. Might as well do something. Yeah. yeah. Well, might as well do something. So I, that's, that's something that, that's something that I know I struggle with too, is that the working out thing when I really don't want to. And sometimes just putting on that workout clothes and just walking down to the gym. And like I have, we live in a condo. So like my gym is in, I don't even have to get in my car. It's just like the little weight room downstairs. So it's like, I don't have an excuse, you know, sometimes just getting down there. And once I'm down there, I'm like, all right, I might as well put some work in. I'm already, I already put on my clothes and walk down here. I might as well put some work in now. Yeah. Like mine's like literally right behind me on the other side of the basement. So yeah, I yeah. Got no excuse. <laughs> yeah. but yeah. I hear you this morning was, that was me. It was me at five 15 huh? this morning. I'm like, Oh, fucking legs. I was like, I rolled over, yeah. oh. put my head under the pillow and I'm like, and then oh. for like probably 30 seconds. And I'm like, and I spoke about this on a podcast I guessed it on recently where it, I was like, it, we were talking about motivations and, mm -hmm. you know, sharing what we're to be motivated. And it's kind of right now it's a bit, um, I don't know, a bit controversial to for your motivation to be what you look like. But for me, like I grew up as a fat kid. So for me, I'm Good. like, I'm like, get out of bed because you don't want to be the fat kid again. So get your fucking exactly. ass up and get downstairs. Yeah. And if that's what, and you know, I was just sharing that sometimes I post stuff about that and you get a lot of mm -hmm. negativity back. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, hey, look, it's my shit. Like, I'm not telling yeah. you you need to be motivated exactly. by that. Just exactly and and look man look I, I totally get it like body shaming is like it sucks it, it can really suck sometimes but like i don't know dude i this this might be controversial too and, and i might get shit for it but like nobody nobody really wants to be overweight like nobody wants to be overweight and nobody wants to like walk up a set of stairs and like be gassed because they walked up one flight i don't i don't want to be and yeah there's a part of me that's vain there's a part of me that likes when my wife says, God damn, babe, you look good. Like, I like that. I like that. And if that's what it takes, like you said, if that's what it takes me to get motivated to get in the gym, like, yes, I, part of me going to the gym and staying fit and eating right is I want to be 80 years old and still be able to walk around on my own and not have to ha use a walker or a wheelchair or somebody else assisting me. I want to be able to be mobile and be active and get around on my own. But then a big part of that too is like, I, I like looking at myself in the mirror and being like, I look pretty good. You know, and my wife telling me, hey, babe, you, you look fucking good. Like, I'm very attracted to you and you're very sexy. Like, I like that, too. Is there anything wrong with that? No, because that's what motivates me, you know, and I just I don't want to be overweight. And it's yes, I don't want to be overweight because I like to look good in my skinny jeans. But it's like I don't want to be overweight because I want to be able to walk up the stairs to my to our you know condo and not be huffing and puffing. You know, I want to be in good shape. And, and that's what motivates me. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And, uh, you know, I can't. I you know, I'm in a world where I see this all the time. And yes, it's, it's a very, and this is kind of what I'm sharing as well Is it's a very different conversation. If you're asking me, because that's my, that's me and my shit. Like when I'm talking mm -hmm. to my clients is very different, right? Like, yeah, so it's, of course. it's, you yeah. know, cause some people have that, some people it's a negative thing. And it's a bit like, you know, and the same thing is I might say, well, you know, if you're looking at a, a weight loss goal, you need to track calories. And then the shit you get is, oh, well, but tracking calories, that's toxic for some people. Yeah. For some people it is great. So then you do it a different way and I can help you with that, but this is how I would do it. Right. So right. it's very different. And you know, yeah. that's, that was kind of the, the dichotomy in it that we were, we were talking about, but yeah, I love that. I love that, that it can be about, it can be about us and it can be about the way we look and the way that makes us feel. And that's yeah. okay. It's not about everyone has to do that. Yeah. So, so yeah. important. I mean, if, if, as long as you're not like, you're like, I'm super ripped and you're not, and you're like <laughs> shaming other people. Like, no, just if you like to look good for yourself, like, and whatever, that's cool. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. No, absolutely agreed. Now I wanted to go back to something else that uh, in, intrigued me and really aligned. Mm -hmm. And you spoke about the the conversation you had with that good friend of yours. I'm very fortunate to have a very close friend of mine, uh, actually, Carl, who's also one of the hosts of the show and the founder of the show. So we have that relationship. And it's interesting that we've been friends for many, many, many years. But uh, about three years ago, he had the we as men start talking. So that's kind of where this genesis of the show came from. And my kind of journey into podcasting in this very open, um, very a very deep sense of communication that I wasn't using. I'm going to say I didn't have it. I wasn't using it. Um, I went on the show as a guest and we had this three hour conversation and it was a conversation that we'd had between us before, maybe not that deep, but we, I never like put it out on the internet for people to listen to. So that was kind of my turning point a little bit. So that really resonated with me. And it made me think about a blog post that 
um, that you put up. So as a good podcast host, I did some snooping. Um, oh, <laughs> had a little look around, <laughs> and you shared a really good post that I'll, I'll paraphrase it because my memory's not that good, but something along the lines of things I wish I'd shared with my brothers, mm-hmm. and I would have mm-hmm. started with "I love you." Um, that really, uh, that really sits sits with me in a special place because I have that relationship with a couple of men in my life and I'd love to just kind of hear a bit more about the kind of genesis of that um that article that blog and you know your kind of thoughts around the way we communicate with other men yeah absolutely I love I love that question and I love this topic um I'm sure growing up you know you had the same thing you had your group of friends and you know you guys would get together and and do whatever it is you know play sports or whatever it is that you guys did and most of your conversations were probably around the topics of sports, women, cars, you know, I don't know, throw in some other manly, quote unquote, manly <laughs> topics in there. And you guys would never talk about feelings and emotions and breakups and, and jealousy and sadness and depression. Like, no, at least I didn't, you know, I never had, you know, I have this one, I have this one friend uh, who still lives back in Miami. We've been tight since fifth grade, you know, him and I have that kind of relationship. Him and I have that kind of relationship where we can show up. We can talk about anything. We can talk about sports and chicks and cars and all this stuff, but we can also talk about, not that we talk about chicks because we're both married, (laughs) but before, you know, um, but we could talk about any of those, you know, kind of service level stuff, but we can also go really deep. We can also share things with each other. One of the best things he's ever shared with me is a few months back we were talking we were talking about like dads you know relationships with our fathers and stuff like that and this is the first time I know him and his dad have have, at least it seems to me like they've had kind of like a contentious relationship over the years and he opened up to me uh you know about some some stuff with his dad and and he started to cry a little bit and he started to to get emotional and it was beautiful it wasn't beautiful because he was feeling pain or sadness in that moment it was be- it was beautiful because he was able to to let that out and and like I, I don't know i haven't i haven't asked him about it since that happened but i'm sure in that moment like he released that and he didn't let that he didn't let himself feel ashamed of that you know he didn't let himself be defined by that you know by by you know the the impact or the effect that his dad has on him he was he felt comfortable enough and trusted me enough to be able to tell me this thing and be like, yo, this, you know, I, I really struggle with this, you know, and it was awesome. And it was awesome. And those are the kind of relationships I, I want to have with my bros. Those are the kind of relationships. Yeah. We can still talk about the other stuff. It's not like we always have to be deep and, and stuff like that, but whenever we need to be, you know, if one of my, if one of my bros goes, you know, goes through a, a tough breakup or a divorce or a death in the family or something tough that like, us men have been told for so long, like, nah, man, just, just fucking suck it up. Just suck it up. Nah, nah, you don't cry. Don't cry. Cry. You're a man, bro. Men don't cry. Especially where I grew up, you know, being a Latino growing up in that sports environment, those are two environments where you're taught to fucking tough it up. You get hit by a pitch. You don't, you don't rub it. Like that was, that was actually a thing in professional baseball. I don't, it, it might still be around, but you get with hit with like a, like I got hit once in the rib cage with like a 95 mile per hour fastball and I couldn't breathe for like a minute. <gasps> I was like, <gasps> I was going to die. And like, I'm sure somebody was just like, don't rub it. Don't rub it. I'm like motherfucker. I can't breathe right now. What do you mean? Don't rub it. Like, you know, but that's the, that's the shit that we grow up around. You know, yeah. it's just like, don't show your weakness. When, when you get hurt, you don't, you tough it up, you put on your game face and you don't show that you're hurt. And like, yes, there's times for that. There's times where you just have to be courageous and you have to, whether it's for your wife, whether it's for your kids, you just have to be that example of like, Hey, dad's, dad's got this shit figured out right now. But then when, when you, when you get past that and when you got, when you figure that shit out, there's nothing wrong with going over to your, one of your boys and be like, yo, I need to, I need to talk. Like, I just went through some shit right now with my wife, with my kids and I, 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 I was tough for them. I was tough for them, but that shit, that shit fucking broke me down. It broke me down. It crushed me. And there's no reason why there shouldn't be any stigma around us opening up about that to our boys, to anybody, but especially to our boys. Those, if those are really our bros, if those are our boys that have our back forever, no matter what, we should be able to open up about that stuff with them. We should be. And if you can't, if you open up about, open up about that stuff, but that sensitive, intimate, you know, softer stuff with one of your really good friends and they shame you and they ridicule you for it. 
fuck that. You don't want to be, you don't want to be in a relationship with that where you can't really show up as yourself. That's a prime. And that's a, that's a red flag right there. That should show you like, maybe me and this dude aren't as tight as I thought we were. Because if you can't really show up as your true self, whether you're having a great day or whether you're having a terrible day, if you can't show up just as you are that day for your boy, then that relationship isn't worth a damn. And those are the kind of relationships that I want to foster with, with the men in my life, with everybody in my life, but especially with the men, because us men, it's a lot easier for women to talk about these things. It's not that it's easy, it's still tough, but it's easier because they're not going to get shamed. They're not going to get ridiculed. When you watch a movie, when you watch TV, you see women, you know, talking about like, oh, my boyfriend cheated on me or he broke up with me or I'm going through this or I'm going through that. You don't see men talking about that stuff. You seem like, man, let's go to the fucking strip club. My chick left me like fucking I'm going to let's go get drunk and do some blow off some strippers or something like that. Like that's the stuff that you see. You don't see men being portrayed in movies and TVs getting real and getting open and getting vulnerable about stuff like that. That's what I want to see more of you know, it's, it's okay to be that tough guy and that, you know, courageous guy as well. I get that there's times for that, but there's also times to just be real and just open up and, and share stuff like that because I held on to that stuff for a really long time and it did me no good, no good. And I'm sure it's the case for many, if not all men holding on to that stuff. Like I was, I, I had a really bad temper. I had a yeah. really bad temper and really bad rage where I, I fucking, I don't know how many walls I punched holes in. I don't know how many windows I broke because I was angry and, and I didn't know how to control that. Honestly, I wasn't really angry. I was scared. I was insecure. Yeah. It was much, it was much deeper than anger, you know? So we need a place to, to talk about that stuff and, and we need it now more than ever. I feel like a hundred percent. We, uh, you know, we, we live by the, uh, by the, I guess you can call it a value uh, on the podcast, which is surround yourself. And, you know, you, you touched on that. You have to be able to surround yourself with those people. And, and I think a really important message is you also have to be able to remove yourself from that. Yeah. If it isn't set boundaries, you, yeah. right? Yeah. Those boundaries, set those boundaries. Yeah. And yeah. it, it doesn't, you know, my, my biggest thing with that is it, I don't owe anyone an explanation. If it isn't where I want to put my energy, Exactly. Then I remove myself from it because yeah. that's so important. And something else that, that really sat with me and we had a conversation a few months back, I actually think it was on one of the shows and we were talking about vulnerability in conversations. And obviously we're talking about men, but this comes with anyone is it's kind of like a handshake and, and you touched on it a little bit where, you know, you extend that handshake of vulnerability out to another man or mm -hmm. whoever mm -hmm. it has to be met with, it has to be met with that. And we have to do a better job as men at meeting someone's vulnerability yeah. with, with vulnerability, because if yeah. you can't listen in a vulnerable state, then what happens is exactly the opposite of what we're looking for is then that person shuts down. Yeah. The second that you share that stuff, right. The second you have that, you know, that emotional moment, you break down, you cry. If that's met with anything other than empathy yeah. and space and vulnerability by the person listening. So, you know, you know, we, you know, we, it's all about talking and conversations, but the other end of that is learn how to listen vulnerably to be okay, Absolutely. being uncomfortable because it isn't comfortable to hear that shit sometimes. Yeah. Someone's Very. telling you, right. It's scary. And, and I'm so glad that you brought that up because I can a hundred percent relate to that. Um, not so much with the vulnerability part, but with kind of like the negativity kind of complaining part, like for so long, I made it, a point to like distance myself from negativity and from complaining and from people, you know, yeah, kind of just like opening up about shit that they were going through. Um, and I thought it was because like, no, I'm, I'm super up. I'm Mr. Optimistic. I'm Mr. Positive energy all the time. Like I don't want to surround myself with that negative. And, and yes, to a certain point, like you don't want to be dragged down by someone who's just got negative energy all the time, but I was doing it so much. So, and I thought like, no, it's because I'm Mr. Positive and I want to spread positive energy and all this stuff. But I wasn't dealing with my own shit. I was putting on this facade and that's what, you know, that's kind of where that name of behind the masculinity came from was I was putting on this facade of like, I'm a happy dude. Everything's great. Life is great. I'm super optimistic. Everything's going to be awesome. But I was fucking struggling with some shit, but being a man, I, I just felt like I, I couldn't talk about that stuff because I'm a man. I need to be tough. I need to, I need to put on this front of like toughness and bravery and courage. So I would distance myself from these negative people and these people complaining, these people talking about their issues, because I justified it as like, no, nah, I just don't want to be around that. I'm, I'm super positive and super energetic. Like, no, nah, I don't want those people to drag me down. But later on, after I started doing some work and in retrospect and look back on that, I wasn't doing that because I didn't want to be around those people. I was doing that because 
those people talking about their issues and their problems and the stuff that they're struggling with reminded me of my own shit that I'm struggling with, shit that I was not ready to deal with. I was not ready to deal with. So what did I do? I distanced myself because whenever those people would come close, I would hear them talking about their struggles and it would instantly remind me of like, hey, you got your own shit to deal with. Are you ready to deal with it? No, I'm not fucking ready to deal with it. No, get away from me. I, I, I'm going to distance myself. So it wasn't that I didn't want to be around those people just because they were negative or complaining or anything. It was because they reminded me of the shit. It was like holding up a, a mirror to my face and be like, hey, you got shit that you need to deal with and you're not dealing yep. with it. And, and I think tying it back into what you were talking about, about men meeting other men with that same vulnerability and being able to listen, I think the biggest part of that or the hardest part of that is when you're not ready to talk about that stuff and somebody else is being vulnerable with you, it's not that you're not ready to listen to it. It's that you're not ready to open up about your own shit and be vulnerable about your own stuff. Because when another dude's being vulnerable, it's not that you have to immediately share your own stuff. But it's gonna, it's gonna kind of prick, it's gonna, gonna prick a hole in that dam, and that little bit of water is gonna start to flow out. And when he starts, when your buddy starts to be vulnerable with you and share that stuff with you, even if you're just sitting there listening and holding that space for him, it's gonna resonate with you. It's gonna be like, all right, dude, you, you got some shit that you should share too. Like, are you ready to share it? And I think, I think that's one of the biggest reasons why men aren't, aren't ready to have these conversations. It's because they're like, I'm not ready to talk about this stuff. Because for whatever reasons, but I think mostly because like, I, I don't want my dude, to, my boy to think I'm a pussy. Like, yeah, nah, this is like pussy shit. Like, I no, this is not something men do. So I think that's a big, a big part of the reason why men don't. Yeah. And maybe that's, you know, it makes me think as well that why these, these conversations, you know, what you're doing on your show, what we're doing, you know, what many, you know, many of the, the, you know, the, the guys that are collaborating with Tether, same thing is, is maybe we, you know, maybe you do have to listen to, if you're listening to this and this is resonating is go listen to another show where this conversation is having, go listen to 10, go listen to 15, go listen to 20 until you can be in that spot until you can, you know, receive that from someone else or you can open up and maybe, maybe it starts, right. We spoke about taking those little actions, maybe, yeah. Yeah listening to this one podcast will do that. Maybe that's your first step. And cause that, that was a lot of my journey. You only get more comfortable. Yeah. Like we were speaking about yeah. the more you do it. Right. So it's yeah. so, so important. And, yeah. it, we, and another thing I wanted to add too, sorry, I didn't mean to cut yeah. you off there, but I think I, I touched on it in that, in that blog post as well was sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes you're, you're with your group of friends and they desperately want to share about something. They're like, dude, I, I, I want to share. I want to share this with my boys, but I can't be that first one. I can't be that first one because I don't know if they're going to call me, if they're going to shame me, if they're going to ridicule me, if they're going to not want to be my friends anymore. And that's the last thing we want when we're, you know, that, that comes down to like our human biology and how we're wired. We don't want to get kicked out of that group to us. Getting kicked out of that group is, is, is synonymous to death. You know, that's, and, and if we, you know, we never know if we share something that somebody might be like, yo, I don't want to hear about your fucking breakup and you crying about your girlfriend that dumped you. Like, no, what? get over it, bro. Like that's scary because you don't want that rejection. So I think, you know, another th big thing is too, like maybe there are some men ready to really to just freaking tear their hearts open and share that stuff, but they just can't. They're just waiting on that one dude, on that one dude. Like as soon as somebody shares, just break that ice, just be that guinea pig. And if you can be that guinea pig, man, you can be that catalyst in that in your group of boys. Maybe, maybe everybody's just waiting, you know, maybe it, maybe it's not like you thinking like, nah, we're all bros. We don't talk about that shit. How do you know? <laughs> maybe everybody else in that group is waiting for you to just open up and be vulnerable and share that. And you'll see how those dominoes start to fall. And then ah, it's just beautiful. It'll just bring you guys closer. Like you got, you, you think you were tight before, like when you start sharing some real vulnerable shit like that, ah, that just solidifies, solidifies your relationship even more, man. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. And I even think as well, like with the, you know, maybe the the way the world the way the world spins right now, and how you know roles are changing a lot from maybe back. And this is not to say mm -hmm. any rights or wrongs, but roles are changing between men and women. Is I even yeah. think there'll be a lot of women listening who possibly don't have those relationships with the other women in their life either. So I think it yeah. crosses over because there's a yeah, lot of pressure totally. now, right? A lot of people, women that are, you know, clearly excelling in a professional world and again there's that expectation and maybe they need to be they need to be able to be a mother and raise kids and be the ceo of a business and yeah. shit like that right yeah. so yeah. because the expectations are growing 
is that then putting them in a spot where they don't have that place to be vulnerable yeah, with? That's a good able. point too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I never thought about that. Yeah. That's a really good point. Yeah. Cause you're right. Roles are changing where, you know, yeah. Maybe, maybe women feel now too, like, nah, I got, I have to be more responsible. I can't, I gotta be, I gotta step into more of my masculine energy. Like I can't be talking about this stuff. Like, yeah, that's a, that's a solid point, man. I never thought about that. Yeah. And no yeah. doubt this has been, and funny enough, part of our evolution as a podcast is uh, we just recently brought Aaliyah on. So she is now the fourth host of the show. And clearly we went nice. out and we were like, we need to have a female voice on the show because I love it. There's so much crossover, right? So we can have yeah. these conversations and, you know, we're, we're co-hosting and there's, you know, female guests with a male and male guests with a male host. And so, yeah, it's going to be a really good, uh, a really good mix. And I think it just crosses over so well. I love it, man. So something else you, you touched on, which I'd love to dig into a little bit too, is you mentioned that you'd have the conversation with a friend of yours about uh, your relationships with your dads. So mm-hmm. this is something that comes up a lot. And this is a big, actually a lot uh, kind of revelation for me with my kind of upbringing and where I was at. And it was something where I always felt like I maybe didn't have this great relationship with my dad and didn't see it because I think it was based on expectation and judgment and what I saw. And, you know, it took a few conversations with, you know, on the podcast and, you know, and then I became a host and we kind of evolved it. And I had many conversations about my story. And I kind of have this story where, you know, we're of a similar age. So growing up in the eighties, I had a dad that went to work. I also had a dad that lost his dad at like eight uh, and went to boarding school, you know, like a male boarding school. So a very, a very different kind of upbringing and approach to what he learned and what he knew. Right. So, and he, you know, gave me great work ethic and showed me what it was to go out and support your family and stuff, but we never really had a deep emotional connection. And that was always something I was like, well, I should have had that. And I should have had Mm -hmm. those, you know, I love you moments. And I should have had all these things that, you know, and anyway, I came to this realization that that wasn't necessarily the, wasn't necessarily the case. And we had, we do have a great relationship and actually part of that's from me accepting that it is what it is and you you do what Mm -hmm. you can. And, and the good things that I did get, I'm teaching to my daughter and the things that I didn't get, I'm also hyper aware of. So I think that's really important. And you touched on it. And, uh, you know, my long winded question there was what was your relationship with your dad like, and how did that impact you through your journey? That's a great question, man. That's actually something that, <laughs> something that my mom and, uh, and I were texting about today. Um, you know, we're just, I don't know how I got to that point, but she asked me, she was like, Oh, just, just random question. Like, are, are you proud? Are you proud of your father? I was like, wow, I never really, I never really thought about that before. Um, and my, my parents are, are split up. Um, they split up when I was like nine or 10 or something, but you know, it's something that I'd never really thought about before. But after she asked that, I was reminded, uh, of something. I, I can't remember who I, I don't know if it was on a podcast or a conversation with, I was having with somebody, but you know, you hear a lot of men talk about like, my dad was my hero. My dad was my role model. I wanted to be just like my, my dad when I was growing up. I never really had that. Like, don't get me wrong. My dad and I had a really good relationship. We still to this very day, like we've always been close. He was my number one fan when I was a baseball player. My dad's, my dad's great. Like he was there. He was supportive. He was everything I could have asked for in a father, but I never really had that sense of like, my dad's my hero. My dad's my role model. I want to be like my dad. Not that he was not worthy of being a role model. I just didn't get that sense. Like I see that a lot. You see it you know, you see it a lot. You see it a lot with a lot of men. Like my dad was it. Like, yeah, I wanted to be just like my dad. I didn't really have that. So for my mom to ask me that, like, it really, it really got me thinking about that. And, you know, there's a lot of things about my dad that, <clears throat> you know, are really good. You know, the, a lot of things that I aspire to, there's a lot of things about my dad that I wish, you know, he had a little bit more of, but again, no, no human being, like, it's hard enough. It's hard enough to be a human being. It's hard enough to be a man in this world. I, I don't have kids. I can't even imagine how freaking tough it is to be a parent. I can't, I, my, I have nieces and nephews. My, my two siblings both have kids. My wife's uh, brother has two kids and we see the, 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 how tough it is. We see how tough it is to be a parent. So my dad was there. My dad provided, my dad was supportive. My dad loved us. My dad came to all my baseball games. I, I, I can't really ask for more as a kid. Like there's so many kids out there whose parents are not even, whose dads are not even there. They're just absent. They're just there. They just, they just leave no contact. Like I can't even, I can't even imagine, but my dad was there in that sense. And there's a lot of things that he, that a lot of qualities about himself that are great qualities that are like, man, I wish I was a little bit more like that. 
But then there's a lot of qualities that I think I have, you know, a little bit more in touch with my emotions, a little bit more affectionate, a little bit more willing to have those deeper conversations that my dad doesn't necessarily have like that, that part, I definitely get more from my mom. But, um, but no, we, we always had a really good relationship, but something that I, I kind of realized over the last couple of years, and this go, goes back to my baseball uh, career, um, whenever my dad, my dad would always come up wherever it is uh, I was playing for at least a week, you know, he'd fly in or he'd drive in and he'd be there for a week. He'd go to all the games. We'd go to dinner afterwards. It was like the, the highlight of my season. I loved it. Um, but then when he wasn't there, we'd talk every day, you know, we'd talk about the game, how it went, yada, yada. And I realized that whenever I had a really good game, I was so excited to get into the clubhouse, get into the locker room and like call my dad, you know, if the time zone permitting and be like, yo, what's up, pops? Did you see? Yeah, I had a good game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You saw those two doubles I got? Yeah, I threw out that guy trying to, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just to hear that pride in his voice, like made, it, it lit me up. It lit me up. It made me feel so good. But then when I had a bad game, I wasn't in a hurry to call him. I was just like, I'll just call him tomorrow. I'll just, nah, I don't need to talk to him now. I had a shitty game. I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to talk to anybody. And, you know, it made me realize like, I love my mom. My mom and I always had the closest, like I was definitely closer with my mom as far as like emotionally closer. Uh, just, just that bond was just closer with my mom, but I really wanted to make my dad proud. I really wanted to make my dad proud. Like I, I, I always knew my mom was proud. Like, of course I still love to make her proud, but I knew we just had this bond and this love that no matter what I knew, like my mom's proud of me. Like, I know, like I could just feel it, you know, with my dad, he wasn't that expressive, you know, like my mom was like, my mom would tell us, I love you a hundred times a day if she could, you know, and, and still to this day, I, I go home and visit my mom and I'll lay my head on her lap and she'll like caress my hair and I'll just feel like a little kid all over again, you know, so I knew, but for my dad, he wasn't very expressive, you know, it wasn't until like maybe a few years ago that we started saying, I love you to each other. Not that I didn't love him or not that he didn't love me. It was just one of those things where it was like, eh, it's kind of weird. We've never really said it to each other. So, but then we started saying it and I love it. We say it to each other all the time now. But I realized, you know, after looking back that I really wanted to make my dad proud. You know, I really wanted to make my dad proud. And, you know, I sure, I'm sure that went into a lot of, you know, my own personal feelings of failure and of feeling like a loser and all this stuff. Um, so, and then another thing that my mom and I were talking about today was she was telling me, and my dad has always been into baseball, but he never played at a professional level or even in like college or university or anything like that. But I know he's always been a huge fan of baseball. But when my mom and I were talking today, she was like, yeah, when your dad came over from Cuba, like he had big dreams, he had big dreams. And like, he was in a free country and he had big dreams of being like this big famous baseball player. And, you know, obviously that didn't work out for him. So I can, I, I definitely know my, my dad has lived vicariously through me. Um, whether there was on a healthy or an unhealthy level, I'm not quite sure yet, but it definitely was nice to have a dad that really cared. And that was really proud of me. You know, so I'm sure that pushed me, but, you know, I don't know to what level that was like, maybe it wasn't healthy. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't realize about him. I knew he was a baseball fan, but I didn't realize like when he came to this country, I think he was like 12 or 13. He was like, I'm in a new country, a free country. You know, uh, I'm going to be, I have so many aspirations and so many dreams and he never, you know, he never lived up to them. They never came to fruition. So it made me wonder like, shit, man, it kind of sounds like my story. Kind of sounds like my story, how did I have these big dreams? And, you know, maybe my dad's going through some of the same shit too. You know, it really, really made me think about it. And I don't know. Yeah, it was just one of those things where I was like, wow, I'd never really asked that question. So I, I was glad, glad I was texting with my mom today and, and she brought that up. But something interesting that, you know, I wanted to mention about my dad, something that happened last year, my wife and I had gone to visit uh, my family in Florida and we drove up, uh, we were staying like at a week at this hotel, like right on the beach. And on the drive up there, you know, we were chatting away, we were chatting about baseball and the conversation went to um, like, you know, some guy that maybe I knew or had played against or had played with or something like that. And whoever that player was, their parents were in the stands and they were rooting him on. And the, I think the kid might've hit a home run or something like his dad got to witness it or whatever. So we were kind of talking about that in the car. And then my dad said, uh, he said something like in passing, like, I know he didn't mean anything by it, but he said something to the effect of, uh, man, I wish that was me. Meaning like, I wish that was me at that baseball game watching my son hit a home run. And again, I know he didn't mean anything by it, but when he said that to me, I was just like, fuck man, like 
is my dad not really proud of me? Like, is he, would he have been prouder of me if I had made it, you know, if, if I had become rich and famous, if he was able to come to my games at a major league stadium, if it was able to watch my games on, on TV and be able to tell people like, Hey, that's my son. So it was one of those moments where, again, it wasn't passing. I know he didn't mean anything by it, but it made me kind of take a step and, and think like, fuck, I don't know if my dad's like fully proud of me. Like, would he have been prouder if I had, you know, had, if I had reached all these dreams and all these accomplishments and, and it, you know, it didn't ruin my day or the vacation or anything like that it didn't ruin our relationship, but it, it, it definitely stuck with me so much so that uh, maybe a month, a few months after that, um, I wrote a letter to him. I wrote a letter to him and I mailed it to him. And I just pretty much told him like, Hey man, like when you said that, like, it kind of made me wonder, like, are you proud of me? And I just pretty much asked him like, Hey man, are you, are you proud of me? And, you know, he ended up call, uh, calling me the day after he got it. He was like, yeah, man, of course I'm proud of you. Like, and it's still, you know, I was hoping to open up a, a, a new line of dialogue and a new depth to our relationship a little bit more in that moment. But it didn't really like my dad's just never been that way. He's just not the type to go really deep like that. He's never been comfortable with like his emotions and stuff like that. I wish he was, you know, and I've kind of been trying a little bit, but, you know, I was hoping that letter would kind of start that process and, and help our relationship go a little bit deeper. But, you know, on the phone call afterwards, like, yeah, it was great to hear him say like, yeah, of course I'm proud of you, man. Like, why, why would you think that? Yeah, of course. Like, yeah, you didn't make it, but so what? Like you got to play for 10 years and I was so proud that I got to go see you play. Of course I'm proud of you. But, you know, it didn't, it didn't really get as deep as I wanted to, but Hey, maybe it was yeah. a good start. Maybe yeah. it was a good start, but, but yeah, like my dad and I have never really had a close really bond like that. Like my mom and I have, like my mom and I are going to be tight like that till, till the day I die or she dies. Um, we've just always been that way. But with my dad, yeah, I've never really, I've never really thought like, cause you know, you hear a lot about, especially, uh, you know, all the books and stuff that I've read, you know, you hear a lot about like, I think they might call it, some people call it like the father gap, like no matter what your relationship with your, with your dad, there's always some gap in there somewhere. And I always thought like, nah, like we, my dad are cool. Like he, he's my biggest fan. Like we're tight. But now after reading all the stuff that I've read, after going through that with my dad, after kind of talking to my mom today about that, like I can see there's definitely, there's definitely a little bit of a gap there. It might not be huge, but there's definitely a gap there that we haven't, we haven't figured out how to navigate or how to cross yet. So, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my relationship with my dad, but like, I love him. He loves me and like, we're, we're good. We're tight, but you know, it, it there's, you know, it could definitely be tighter for sure. Yeah. You know? And and I would definitely agree with that, you know, with that, that gap. And I hope that, that, well, I know, I know from these conversations that even if it's in small part, that gap, I think is changing. Mm -hmm. um yeah. just based on the way that we're showing up as men in the world we're showing up Absolutely. as dads to our to our kids and it makes me think that it actually just a bit of a realization for me when you were talking about the about how that kind of frustration that anger that sense of um you know that the fear of failure and that you know you're not good enough all the things we already touched on and this is not to pin this on our dads in any way shape or form or anyone yeah. else's but the it seems to be a very a very tight like correlation between not having that as kids as men and how we transition through those like 20s those formative yeah. kind of like years as an adult right like because i feel very much the same way and a lot of what you shared is what i felt in my life and mm -hmm. again i didn't have that with my dad like i know that i i knew that like you said i kind of knew he was proud um but my mum told me she was proud of me yeah. So I always got mm -hmm. that. Right. And I think a lot of us got that as, as, as boys growing up and we didn't get that enough from our dads. And it's led us to this place where we don't really know where we sit in that capacity. Is anyone proud of us? Are we really good enough? Yeah. Cause we yeah. want to be, we want to emulate, we want to be, we want to make them proud. Right. That's what we mm -hmm. want to do as kids. And yeah, we didn't, we didn't get, we didn't get that. And it's led to this generation of men that now just are a bit, maybe some of us are figuring it out. Hopefully mm -hmm. I think I'm figuring it out, but we need, we need that as parents. And I'm very cognitive yeah. like of that when I'm with yeah. my daughter is like, I'm always going to tell her I'm proud. And a big thing for me is not only am I proud of you, but are you proud of you? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. to build that inner self-worth for yeah. her, right? She'll always hear it from me. And, you know, whether it's just using our manners or it's doing something spectacular or whatever it is, it's never, there's never going to be a moment where there's an assumed proudness from me. Like she's going to know. 100% like anything love being proud whatever you 
whatever needs to be said needs to be said. You can't just think, oh, well, they'll, they'll know I love them because they're X, Y, Z. Like, mm-hmm. Tell them, yeah. right? Make sure they know. Dude, you. Uh, I wish more people would realize it doesn't matter if you're a kid or if you're 80 years old. I don't know. I'm not 80 years old, so maybe it'll change. But like, I, I don't see it changing. But like, like the those three words, I'm proud of you. Four words. Those four words, I'm proud of you. Like, dude, they can they can do so much for somebody, especially coming from a parent. And yeah, like you said, I don't up until that letter, I wrote that letter to my dad. I don't think uh I don't think I had ever heard him actually say, like, I'm so proud of you. Like I, I can see it in his face and his excitement and his joy and like his high fives and his hugs, but I don't think I had ever heard him say, like, I'm proud, like look me in the eyes and be like, I'm so damn proud of you. My mom, yeah, all the time, all the time, all the time. But yeah, with my dad, like, I don't think I ever heard him actually verbalize. I can feel it. I can feel it. At least I thought I could, but I never heard him verbalize it. And dude, I'm, I try to say that as much as possible now. I just said it the other day to my sister. She was talking about like work and like a 10 year anniversary she had just hit at work. And I was texting with her. I was just like, I'm just, I'm so damn proud of you. So damn proud of you. And like to hear that from my siblings or from my mom or from anybody, it feels really good, especially like when you're going through some shit and you're really down on yourself and you know, something that I struggle with. I don't, I don't, you know, especially texting with my mom today. I think I kind of came to the realization because she was telling me some amazing things that made me feel really good. But she was like, you have to be proud of yourself. And I think that's something that I struggle with. I think that's something that I really struggle with. I feel like I'm, I'm not proud of me. Yeah, we and and yeah. to you know to the last point I made, right? It, it's so important that we foster that in people, and it isn't just our kids. Like, and I talk as a parent because that's my mm-hmm. this whole like fucking like you said, brand new fucking world of the last four years where I've yeah. got no idea what I'm doing and I'm trying to figure it out every day. But it, it's that it's finding these things and realizing that I'm in a place where same as you, it's hard. I'm, I struggle to be proud of myself, and I'm always like, it's always like the next thing. Like I'm, I do this really well, go to the next thing, go to the next thing. Can I achieve more? And I think it's because of that reassurance. And it's not just the reassurance of having that from a parent or the people around you. It might not be your parents, but it's the um, it's building our own self-worth. So that's why I'm always very aware of saying, you know, and even if, and obviously my daughter has now got to the point where she'll ask me, daddy, are you proud of me? This is what I did at school <sighs> today. And I always say to her, yeah, I am. But more importantly, are you proud of you? Yeah. Like, cause that I need her to know that, like she needs to know I'm proud of her for sure. She's had it enough the last four years. She gets it, but it's for (laughs) her to understand that. Cause if I'd had that, I believe that, you know, if I'd had that in, in my growing up, you know, maybe I wouldn't be where I am because it's part of the journey. But you know, with that, I think comes that ability to, to be able to build that inner self-worth and maybe we wouldn't all be struggling. And like you said, right. We're not punching holes in walls because we don't know how to express how we feel because we've got the skills that we need. Yeah. And I, and I think one of the big things out there too, one of the big arguments is like, oh yeah, kids these days, they're too, they're too coddled and they get, you know, participation trophies for everything. And and yeah, I'm sure there's a part of it that gets a little too extreme where, you know, it's, it's good to taste some failure. I get it. it. It's definitely good to taste some failure and be able to bounce back from that. But, you know, this is another conversation my mom and I had pretty recently is, you know, I, I kind of told her, I was like, mom, like, thank you for loving me and for supporting me and for doing everything that you did to me for me. But I think that also when I got a little bit, a little bit older, it kind of led me to a place of like always expecting that support and that love and that kind of, you know, somebody there for me, helping me through something that I think I got a little used to that. So, you know, when I got a little bit older, I kind of had to like figure that out on my own. And I didn't really, I wasn't really prepared to do that. And she was, she straight up told me, she was like, oh no, yeah, I coddled you. Yeah. Yeah. I coddled you. I coddled you. And I was just like, and I was just like, yeah, she was like, yeah, I coddled you. Yeah. Did I maybe mess you up a little bit? Yeah. Like, yeah. But dude, I'd rather be coddled and deal with those, you know, ramifications, whatever they be, they may be, than be, than have parents that don't give a shit about me and have to deal with those ramifications. Because I think those are exponentially more damaging than a kid that's coddled and maybe pampered and maybe baby too much. Yeah. There's going to be some bad ramifications with that. But when you have a kid who doesn't have parents that love him, who doesn't have kid parents that support him, who, do, who doesn't have people in his life that make him feel like he matters, yeah. like he's worthy of something that shit will fuck you up. Like, yeah, obviously, you know, maybe calling a little too much, maybe it's weird because my mom told me she was proud of me all the time and, and she called me, but 
I still have this, you know, I'm still hampered by the sense of like not being proud of myself. So who knows where that's coming from? But I mean, I'd much rather have the parents that I had, especially the mom that I had that loved me and pampered me and coddled me still to this very day than have parents who don't give a shit. Like that's, yeah. I see that in some kids and it's terrible. It's terrible. And, yeah. And you know, I'm so, I'm sure some, uh, some psychologists might get on our case about this, but I a hundred percent agree with you. And yeah. honestly, you get a bit coddled, you get a bit pampered and maybe you're not exposed to the real world. Like you'll fucking figure it out when you got to get yeah. a job and get an apartment and yeah. do shit on mm-hmm. your own. You figure that mm-hmm. shit out a lot quicker yeah. than undoing all of the fucking abandonment issues and the lack yeah. of self-confidence and the fucking yeah. fear of failure and all that shit that we go through when we exactly. don't have that support. Right. Yeah. Exactly. That's so, so important. Yeah. And I really appreciate Agreed. you sharing that. I know that of course for me with, you know, my upbringing and my parents and, you know, I'm very grateful that I had a great upbringing with both my parents there. And, you know, that was really important, but I know that's a hard thing to share. It was a hard thing for me to talk about. And I I think the last thing that I really wanted to kind of bring that together with is that when we look back at our parents and the people, our role models in our life is, I think that, you know, you spoke about your dad kind of being like, you know, he's your hero, he's your role model. And it, it made me think, and what I wrote down here is that, heroes come in different forms and role models come in different forms and maybe it's what we're exposed to and this is definitely me so just speaking from my own personal Mm -hmm. experience what i was exposed to was this expectation of what you should be to be my hero what you should be to be my role model and what i figured out from talking about it is that i got a role model for work ethic i got a role model for being there i got a role model for the the logic and uh, mm-hmm. and actually probably some of the smart wit and some of the other things that I really appreciate that I got from my dad. Mm-hmm. I didn't get some of the other stuff, but you know what? I'm, I'm figuring it out, but he yeah. was my, you know, when I, if somebody says to me, where do you get that work ethic from? I'm like 100% my dad without yeah. a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. So, you know, that commitment and that, you know, many things that he brought to the table. And now I look, I look at him very different as a man because he is, he is my role model for many of the things that, that I've grown to, but I never saw it like that till recently. So yeah, I think that's, that's awesome. important. Yeah. Remember yeah, that. That's remember. awesome. Yeah, no, that's great. I love that. Thanks for sharing that. And, and yeah, heroes, heroes are flawed too. Yeah. Heroes are flawed too. Heroes aren't perfect, man. Like we, we put them up on this pedestal and we, we think they're perfect, but I'd rather have a hero who's flawed. I'd rather have a hero who like, man, that guy's awesome. Like I want to be just like that dude. And then, here, like he struggles with this and I'll be like, Oh shit, me too. He's not perfect. I'm not perfect. All right. Shit. He's my hero even more now. <laughs> I, uh, just, all I can think about now is Deadpool. Um, <laughs> what a hero. <laughs> <laughs> See, I love Ryan Reynolds as an actor, man. <laughs> like he's, he's so good, man. The best. Um, listen, look, we're, uh, we're going to pretty much, uh, pretty much a time here. I want to respect that time as I know yeah. you've got to be somewhere. So I'm going to, uh, wrap the, uh, wrap the show up a little bit, but I just want to say any final kind of thoughts, anything else you wanted to share before I close up the show? Um, yeah, man, something that I've, that I've, you know, say a lot is this whole like self-made, you know, people usually attested to like self-made millionaire or whatever it is, you know, this whole notion of self-made, this whole notion of lone wolf, like, especially for us, man, that we have to do it alone. We have to figure it out. It's such bullshit, man. It's such bullshit. None of us, none of us, none of us get through life alone. None of us, none of us. So, you know, to think that you have to do, if you're struggling with something, if you're going through something to think that you have to go through it alone, to think that it makes you weak because you ask for help because you reach out to somebody, because you're vulnerable with somebody and say, hey, I'm scared. I can't figure this out. I need help. That's, that's one of the most, especially as a man, I think that's one of the most courageous things you can do to ask for help because we're taught that we don't do that, that men don't do that. So to do something that goes against the grain, that goes against something that you're taught since you're a little kid, that's, for me, that's courageous as hell. Yeah, I love it. A great, great, uh, great point to finish on. Um, and Kristen, just want to thank you for being on the show. Uh, I've been an amazing guest, shared some really insightful stuff. So I really appreciate your time. Um, I hope we can uh, get you back on in the future. I know we're going to collaborate some more through Tether. For sure, man. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is actually our, for anybody that's listening, this is actually Gareth and I first actual conversation. Yeah. Like we've had a little interaction, like on, you know, Instagram and stuff like that, but this is our first conversation. And I think it went awesome, man. So I'm really looking forward to collaborating some more and doing some stuff with you. And, and it's just awesome to connect with somebody who's just doing like-minded things in the world, man, especially for, for us men, especially on topics like this. So just thank you, man. Yeah. 
thank you um yeah it definitely uh definitely does that resonates with me and it's the uh the permission for us to keep doing it so uh mm-hmm. listen thank you for tuning in thank you for being here today and listening to the show everyone uh, i hope you got something amazing you picked up some great points you picked up some useful stuff that you can take away in your life and if you did please share it share it with someone you love and care about share it with another man in your life another woman in your life whoever it is and uh, if you are you know if you're if you're around and you want to contribute like i mentioned earlier you can head over to patreon you can head over to our buy me a coffee account and you'll also be able to find all christian's contact details i'm going to post his podcast links and everything in the show notes so you'll be able to find out everything uh, and that you, that you need to uh, and that's it listen everyone be the best possible version of yourself keep making a difference in the world and we'll catch you on the next episode